In part one, we saw how Erta Oberhäuser grew up and studied medicine in Dusseldorf. In 1940, she applied for a position at Ravensbrück concentration camp, where, against all medical ethics, she participated in forced experiments on Polish female prisoners, some of whom died as a result of these experiments, some of whom were left with lifelong injuries, and others who were murdered once the experiments were completed. In 1943, Herta Oberhäuser was moved to the clinic at Hochenlichen, where she continued these criminal experiments with SS doctor Karl Gebhardt, who was working under the auspices of Heinrich Himmler. The Red Army captured Hochenlichen on the 1st of May 1945, and one week later Herta Oberhäuser was arrested. She had to wait 18 months before being put on trial. After the main Nuremberg trial, which was a joint effort by the United States, Soviet Union, United Kingdom and France to try the leaders of the Third Reich, the US alone held 12 more subsequent trials to judge other people alleged to have been involved in the crimes of the National Socialist regime. The first subsequent trial was the Nuremberg Doctors' Trial. It took place from the 9th of December 1946 to the 20th of August 1947 in the very same Nuremberg Palace of Justice where the main trial had taken place. The American Military Tribunal was in session for 139 days of proceedings. There were 23 accused, 20 were concentration camp doctors, as well as a lawyer and two administrative personnel as organisers of medical crimes. Karl Brandt was the main defendant, after whom the case was officially named the United States vs. Karl Brandt et al. Further subsequent trials also took the name of the lead defendant. The accused faced four charges. 1. Conspiracy to commit war crimes and crimes against humanity as described in counts 2 and 3. 2. War crimes, performing medical experiments without the subject's consent on prisoners of war and civilians of the occupied countries, in the course of which experiments the defendants committed murders, brutalities, cruelties, tortures, atrocities and other inhumane acts. Also, planning and performing the mass murder of prisoners of war and civilians in occupied countries, stigmatised as aged, insane, incurably ill, deformed and so on, by gas, lethal injections and diverse other means in nursing homes, hospitals and asylums during the euthanasia programme and participating in the mass murder of concentration camp inmates. 3. Crimes against humanity, committing crimes described under Count 2 and also on German nationals. 4. Membership in a criminal organisation, the SS. Herta Oberhäuser was indicted on the first three charges. She could not be indicted on the fourth charge. Membership of the SS was open only to men. I'll do a video though in the future to explain the female role in the SS. The first charge was dropped, leaving war crimes and crimes against humanity. She was defended by Alfred Seidel, who had defended Rudolf Hess and Hans Frank in the main war crimes trial. Frank was sentenced to death and Hess got life imprisonment, but Seidel never gave up on Hess and attempted to assist him for more than 40 years. Seidel was born on the 30th of January 1911 in Munich. He'd been a Nazi supporter and spent the war in the army. At the doctor's trial, as well as Herta Oberhäuser, he also represented Fritz Fischer and Karl Gebhardt. Future clients include Hans Heinrich Lammers, Oswald Paul, Walter Dürfeld, Hermann Fischer and Ilse Koch, amongst others. Herta Oberhäuser had worked for Professor Karl Gebhardt at both Gravensbrück and later at Hochenlichen. Gebhardt was a protégé of Himmler. He'd gone to the same school where Himmler's father was headmaster and later Gebhardt had been the Himmler family doctor, although not the personal physician of Heinrich Himmler. He had participated in the Beale Hall Putsch and on the 9th of November 1923 had treated the wounded. However, he did not join the Nazi party until after it came to power and that was, as he said at the trial, because every full professor had to be a party member. 
He was described in a 1947 article in Der Spiegel as a 50-year-old stocky man with an officer's coat and a short haircut who stepped up to the microphone in an emphatically correct manner. He made his statement self-confidently and apodictically, that is to say, he said things that could easily be proven. Behind the dark horn-rimmed glasses, the short-sighted eyes can only be assumed. The energetic mouth somewhat softens the impression of squareness that comes from the square face. They are the words of Der Spiegel. Gephardt only partially admitted his responsibility for the human experiments because he repeatedly turned to Himmler and insisted on the stricter screening of the doctors involved in the experiments. Gebhardt recognised his responsibility for the sulfonamide tests on 60 Polish women in Ravensbrück. However, the initiative, he claimed, came from Robert Gravitz, who by this time was conveniently dead. In fact, you saw how he died. Of course, I presume you saw downfall. He was the one who killed himself and his family with two grenades. Gebhardt claimed in court that he had not carried out the experiments to the specifications of Gravitz, who had wanted absolutely warlike wounds. The mortality was minimal, claimed Professor Gebhardt. Gebhardt claimed in court that, and now I quote, Stupid and untrue is the view of lay people who call it an outrageous crime when people are infected with gas gangrene. As is well known, gas gangrene only occurs due to a shift in pressure in the muscle tissue, so that it cannot be said to be human cruelty. I must insist there that I am quoting, I don't know what the effects of gas green are. To make the point, Gebhardt offered to be a subject for wound gas green experiments on himself in order to prove that the experiments were harmless. The court didn't take him up on his offer. Instead, it sentenced him to death on the 20th of August 1947. He was hanged on the 2nd of June 1948 in Landsberg Prison in Bavaria. During the trial, Gebhardt was prepared to blame co-defendant Franz Fischer, but tried to exonerate Herta Oberhäuser. This must have made things quite difficult for their lawyer, Alfred Seidel. In her official affidavit concerning the medical experiments carried out in Ravensbrück on Polish inmates, Goethe Oberhäuser played on the sexism that was deeply rooted in Nazi ideology. Oberhäuser attempted to minimalise her role in the camp by claiming she was only involved to the extent that her gender would allow as an assistant to camp physician Dr. Shidlowski. Although she admitted having detailed knowledge of experiments using sulfonamide and bone transplants, she attested that her main role was screening the experimental subjects who were named on a roster given to her by the camp administration. Once in possession of the list, Oberhäuser asserted that her sole role was to determine the state of the prisoner's health. If believed to be insufficiently healthy for an experiment, then, based on her brief examination of the skin and heart rate, she claimed that she would have notified the camp physician who would have ordered fresh patients. Once the girls had been replaced by healthier inmates, Oberhäuser claimed that it was up to Dr. Fritz Fischer to perform the operations. Whilst she maintained that she only sometimes helped and assisted at these operations, her only other duty was to monitor the patient's post-operative care. At the trial, Oberhäuser claimed that during her time at Ravensbrück she observed harsh maltreatment of inmates by Dr. Walter Sontag, who would physically hit those sick prisoners who reported to the sick ward for treatment. Lethal injections were often given to those who were dying, and there were a lot of people close to death at Ravensbrück. She admitted to having given five or six such injections. As she claimed only to be an assistant, she said that she didn't know or couldn't remember the severity of the injuries made on experimental patients, nor for that matter which muscles or bones were used for the purposes of experiments. She went on to claim that she was unable to say with certainty how many persons suffered permanent injuries, only that three died as a result of the experiments, and, as far as she could remember, a total of 40 people were used for such experiments. In fact, the number of victims of these deadly experiments ran into hundreds. Despite Oberhäuser's attempts to belittle the role she played under the guise of femininity, 
and deferring the responsibility to the male doctors throughout the trial, the cross-examination of various witnesses, women who did not perish from the horrific experiments, painted a totally different picture. These women who were brave enough to face their torturers were absolutely indispensable in exposing Oberhäuser as being just as merciless as the male doctors, often in charge of monitoring patients' post-operative care. On the 20th December 1946, 37-year-old Polish former inmate Władysława Karolewska came to Nuremberg to testify at the doctor's trial. She had been a victim of the experimental sulfonide treatments and bone, muscle and nerve transplant. She identified Gebhard Fischer in Oberhäuser sitting in the dock. Władysława Karolewska was born in Juromin on the 15th of March 1909. Before the war, she had been a teacher living in Grudjons, but during the occupation, she fled to Lublin. When the Gestapo searched their house looking for a former Polish army officer, they couldn't find him, but she and all the occupants of the flat were arrested. After being interrogated in Lublin, she was transferred to Ravensbrück in July 1943. She testified thus, On the 22nd July 1942, 75 prisoners of our transport that came from Lublin were summoned to the commandant of the camp. On the 25th of July, all the women from the transport of Lublin were summoned by Maria Mandel, who told us that we were not allowed to work outside the camp. The next day, 75 women were summoned again and we had to stand in front of the hospital in the camp. Present were Shidlowski, Oberhäuser, Rosenthal, Kergel, and the man whom afterwards I recognised as being Dr. Fischer. On the 14th of August of the same year, I was called to the hospital and my name was written on a piece of paper. I didn't know why. Besides me, eight other girls were called to the hospital. We were called at a time when executions normally took place and I thought I was going to be executed because some girls had already been shot. In the hospital we were put to bed and the ward in which we stayed was locked. We were not told what we were to do in the hospital and when one of my comrades asked, she got no answer but an ironic smile. Then a German nurse arrived and gave me an injection in my leg. After this injection I vomited and I was weak. Then I was put on a hospital cot and they brought me to the operating room. There, Dr. Shidlowski and Rosenthal gave me the second intravenous injection in my arm. A while before I noticed Dr. Fisher who left the operation theatre and had operating gloves on. Then I lost consciousness and when I revived I noticed I was in a proper hospital ward. I recovered consciousness for a while and I noticed severe pain in my leg. Then I lost consciousness again. I regained consciousness in the morning and then I noticed that my leg was in a cast from the ankle up to the knee and I felt very great pain in this leg and I had a high temperature. I noticed also that my leg was swollen from the toes up to the groin. The pain was increasing and the temperature too and the next day I noticed that some liquid was flowing from my leg. The third day I was put on a hospital trolley and taken to the dressing room. Then I saw Dr. Fisher again. He had on an operating gown and rubber gloves on his hands. A blanket was put over my eyes and I did not know what was done with my leg but I felt great pain and I had the impression that something must have been cut out of my leg. Those present were Shidlowski, Rosenthal and Oberhäuser. Two weeks later we were all taken to the operating theatre again and put on the operating tables. The bandage was removed and that was the first time I saw my leg. The incision went so deep that I could see the bone. While I was in the hospital, Dr. Oberhäuser treated me cruelly. When I was in my room, I remarked to fellow prisoners that we were operated on in very bad conditions and left here in this room and we were not even given a chance to recover. This remark must have been overheard by a German nurse who was sitting in the corridor because the door leading to the corridor was opened. Then the German nurse came into our room with Dr. Oberhäuser. Dr. Oberhauser told us to dress and come to the dressing room. We put on our dresses and, being unable to walk, we had to hop on one leg into the operating theatre. After one hop we had to rest. Dr. Oberhauser did not allow anybody to help us. When we arrived at the operating theatre, quite exhausted, Dr. Oberhauser appeared and told us to go back 
because the change of dressing would not take place that day. The pus was flowing from my leg until June 1943. A second round of horrific operations were performed on Władysława Karolewska, although that was after Oberhäuser had left Ravensbrück. I might deal with this in a completely separate video. It is a wonder that Władysława Karolewska survived after all that she went through. Another survivor from Poland, Zofia Bai, said that Oberhäuser would beat women who had come to have their legs looked after and which had been badly cut during their work. Prisoner Zofia Machka, upon her arrival at Ravensbrück, was assigned to the hospital as an X-ray technician. In her testimony, Machka said that the nature of the conditions under which experiments were performed by Oberhäuser were atrocious. Not only were the assistants unqualified, but also the bandages were unsterile. After the experiments, the patients were completely neglected. In the sick rooms, the stench was terrible. When changing bandages under the eyes of the doctors, dirty instruments and unsterile dressings were used. Machka explained that there were two main groups in which girls were placed, Group A and Group B. The first group was subject to experiments that would develop an infection resulting from the injections of various bacteria such as tetanus and gangrene. On these test subjects, treatments of sulfonide injections were used to study the effectiveness of the drug. The second group was assigned sterile operations, which consisted of moving pieces of bone or muscle in order to observe the resulting nerve regeneration and or damage. Machka claimed that although her observations were only made through the use of a small keyhole because prisoner employees of the hospital were strictly forbidden in the operating room during experimental operations, she was able to give the names of the patients as well as the exact measurements regarding the length and depth of the wounds, whereas Oberhäuser in her affidavit, not surprisingly, could not recall. Machka was one of the most crucial witnesses in exposing the discrepancies between Oberhäuser's actions in the camps and her official affidavit. Whereas Oberhäuser previously made the claim that if some women were found to be unsuitable for experiments, after being examined before the operation, she would report to the camp physician and have these women switched out for healthier experimental subjects. Machka told a completely different story. In one instance, for example, Machka, upon examining a set of x-rays, noticed that there were two non-Polish women with abnormally unhealthy bones. When she presented this information at Oberhäuser, Oberhäuser replied, It's in our interest to discover what influence such pathological alterations may have on the bone structure. Furthermore, whereas Oberhäuser stated that there were only 40 girls experimented upon, Machka, along with the survivors of these experiments, all remember 74 Polish prisoners who had suffered through operations with accounting for those who died during the process. Without even considering the ethical implications, not only did these young women suffer great agony at the hands of these doctors, but because the consequences of the operations were not accurately examined, there was no medically significant scientific outcomes. According to Machka, research into the regeneration of cells would have taken several months, if not years. Yet the experiments on human women carried out at Ravensbrück only lasted a matter of weeks, producing little, if anything, of scientific value. Oberhäuser even admitted to the lack of scientific importance, stating unintentionally, these experiments at least had one advantage. I learnt a bit more about operating and I got a better job as a result at Hochenlüchen. Zofia Sokolaska was another Polish female prisoner subjected to horrific pseudo-experiments. While recovering from her second operation, Sokolaska claimed to have seen Oberhäuser personally select patients who were taken by nurses into a small room in the hospital. At a later time, Oberhäuser, accompanied only by either nurse Gerda Kernheim or Fina Pouts, entered the room and gave the women lethal injections. Few women lived to tell what had happened to them inside the walls of Ravensbrück medical block. Those who did survive often did so with the help or at the expense of others. 
Yanya Ivanska had been selected to be sent to a gas chamber but managed to hide in the camp with four other post-experiment victims. They were able to change their camp numbers, but that would have come at the cost of others who were sent to be murdered in their place. The prosecution rested their case against Oberhäuser with the following statement. The only question is whether the defendant participated in the crime, not whether it could have been prevented by the defendant. A concentration camp guard can only say with considerable truth that if she or he had not committed a certain crime, then someone else would have done so. But this is simply no defence, nor is it a mitigating factor. There may well have been other people involved and willing to commit crimes such as Fischer and Oberhäuser did, but the significant point is that Fischer and Oberhäuser did, in fact, commit these crimes. Hoping to leverage her career in order to become a successful physician, Oberhäuser willingly conducted these horrific experiments on humans without their consent, which, for those who were not murdered in the process, often resulted in permanent and very painful disabilities. In Nazi ideology, the place of a woman was in the home, and this, at least in theory, meant that there were fewer jobs in the workplace. Oberhäuser probably saw her role in the concentration camp as an opportunity that she would use to prove that she was just as qualified as her male counterparts. Oberhäuser tried to justify the experiments that they served the purpose of saving the lives of 100,000 wounded Wehrmacht soldiers. Oberhäuser also explained in court that she knew nothing about what was happening in the camp or could no longer remember it but at the same time she repeatedly referred to her position as that of a doctor. She also stated that orders had the effect on her as if they had come directly from Adolf Hitler and were therefore legitimate. When interviewed after the war, Oberhäusen, Fischer and others stated that they had given the women condemned to death a chance to survive with these experimental operations. However, this is just not true. Many, once they'd recovered from the experiments, were often murdered or died as a result of further experiments. Gebhardt also used this tactic. However, in his case, he qualified the remark by saying that the future of such post-experiment victims was in the hands of Himmler, thus accepting that they were killed, but that was not the fault of the staff at Ravensbrück, Auschwitz or Hochenlüchen. sentences you, Werther Oberhäuser, to imprisonment for a term of 20 years to be served at such prison or prisons or other appropriate place of confinement as shall be determined by competent authority. The officer of the guard will remove the defendant, Werther Oberhäuser. Fritz Fischer. Military Tribunal 1 has found and adjudged you guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and membership in an organization declared criminal by the judgment of the International Military Tribunal as charged under the indictment heretofore filed against you. For your said crimes, on which you have been and now stand convicted, Military Tribunal 1 sentences you, Fritz Fischer, to imprisonment for the full term and period of your natural natural life, to be served at such prison or prisons or other appropriate place of confinement as shall be determined by competent authority. On the 27th of August 1947, the doctor's trial resulted in seven men being sentenced to death, life imprisonment for five, two 20-year sentences, one 15-year sentence, one 10-year sentence, and seven acquittals. Hertha Oberhäuser received a 20-year prison sentence. 
in part three we shall continue with the story of her life.